Yo, what's going on, y'all? It's Cone back here again today with another episode of After the Buzzer, the show where I recap the NBA games from the night. And there wasn't nearly as much NBA action tonight as there was the night prior, but there is still a lot to get into. And I want to begin by talking about the Thunder versus Hawks game, one that was pretty back and forth for the first three quarters. And then the Hawks ended up getting annihilated by the Thunder in the fourth, outscored by 21 points, which as a Thunder fan, I can tell you, is kind of how all of OKC's first three games have gone, where it starts off the opposing team gets a little bit of a lead and it feels like, oh, the Thunder are playing up to their best. And then at either the third or the fourth quarter, or usually both, they will go ahead and just completely turn on the Jets and wipe the floor of the team in front of them. Now the third straight blowout that they've gotten in three games, kind of just sleepwalking into 20 plus point wins. And everybody contributed in a big way in this game against the Hawks. Shea, 35, 11, and nine, one assist away from a triple double, three steals, three blocks, two of each of those away from a five by five as a guard, shut 46 percent from the field, 38 percent from three, hit a few of them. That pull-up three continues to be a real thing for Shea. He looks completely unstoppable, locked in defensively, and the playmaking from Shea to open the season has been ridiculous. His vision has never been this good. He's seeing the floor extremely well. I think he only had one turnover in this game, I believe, and it was before any of his assists. So he had nine straight dimes without getting a single turnover. He is in full MVP level form. Then you had J-Dub dropping 20 points, nine rebounds, five assists, and two steals on 47 percent shooting, doing great things as that extra offensive option whenever he was handling the ball he was doing a really good job and it still feels like he could play way better than this he's missing a lot of shots that he's made over the first two years of his career Dort hit four threes and locked up Aaron Wiggins had nine points it's been a great start to his season Alex Crusoe had three steals and two blocks he's been ridiculous Casey Wallace had trailing an absolute hell out there for multiple possessions everybody has been impressive to begin this year it has been the statement first three games that I wanted to see from my favorite team but maybe nobody's more impressive in fact I will say nobody has been more impressive for sure than Chet Holmgren. And I tried to warn people coming into the season that year two Chet was going to be a different animal. I mean, anytime he posted anything on social media, you saw any clips of him, it was him working on basketball or, you know, in the weight room, in the gym. He was nonstop hooping, working with trainers, scrimmaging against other NBA players at camps, you name it, basketball related, Chet was probably doing it. And not to mention, he's coming off a year where he was in his first season playing against NBA physicality after a year ending injury took away what was supposed to be his rookie season and still had one of the best rookie big seasons of all time. Putting up 16 and a half points per game, eight rebounds, two and a half dimes, right around three blocks, was shooting 37% from deep and playing all 82 games as the rim protector, the anchor of a top five defensive unit. He legitimately had one of the best rookie seasons I've ever seen. He got all defensive team votes. I firmly believe he should have been on one of those teams. And he was second in rookie of the year only behind Victor Wembanyama. And it feels like because Wemby was so ridiculous and won it unanimously, Chet's all-time rookie season got forgotten. But I promise you, Chet's not being overshadowed right now because he is currently setting the league on absolute fire. Like tonight when he had 25 points, nine rebounds, four assists, a steal, and six blocks on 67% shooting. Oh, and that comes with three threes. The game prior against the Bulls where he had 21 points and 16 boards with three stocks. And his first game of the year, thrown into the fire up against Nikola Jokic. Most people's pick for the best player in the world, pretty much the unanimous best center in the league. And Chet played amazing defense defense blocked him a couple of times. I think held him to like two of seven shooting or something like that. Knocked away multiple entry passes. And on the other end, he had 25 points, five rebounds, four assists, two steals. He had four blocks on 61% shooting. He has been one of the most unstoppable players on both ends to begin the year. Currently through the first three games, Chet is averaging 23 points, 15 rebounds, 2.5 assists, and four blocks on 53% shooting. And that efficiency is without the three-point shot falling before today. And Chet was just a near 40% three-point shooter. So that efficiency is going to come up and the points per game might rise too. I don't have a lot of words to describe just how insane he has been. He is currently leading the league in rebounds and blocks with an efficient 23 points per game. Do you realize how insane that is? In fact, he's leading the league in stocks that's combined steals and blocks total. It's him. And fun fact, second one is Shea Gilgis Alexander. If you want to know how insane the Thunder defense has been, like right now, Chet is right alongside Anthony Davis as the most impactful defenders in the entire league to start the season. I'll never forget when coming into his rookie year, there were all these people saying, oh, he's too skinny. He can't do this. He can't do that. He can't be the five. And then right from the get-go, he anchored a top five defense in his first season. He averaged multiple blocks per game. And it's just because he has such great technique. He has such great length. And even if you knock him off his spot, he can recover. 
and it hasn't mattered. The weight thing, like sure, there were a couple of times he's gotten bullied, but for the most part, he's getting the better of almost every single big man that he plays. And he just has such good timing on everything, the rotation, the knowledge of where to be, when to be. He is one of the smartest defenders in the entire league, and that comes with crazy offensive improvement. So far to start the season, he's been much more aggressive. He's getting to his spots, handling the ball more, a nice little mid-range jumper here and there, finishing through contact, getting to the free throw line, which is really big for anybody who wants to improve as a scorer in the NBA. You have to find a way to get to the line, slow things down, just knock down some shots from there, and he's doing that. He's getting to the line way more often because he's going into contact. He's finishing through it, forcing guys to foul him because if you don't, he's going to just put the ball up and in grabbing a lot more rebounds. Like I said, currently leading the league in boards because he's done a better job of positioning himself, of boxing other guys out, of reaching up and grabbing offensive rebounds, which is big too, because the Thunder, in addition to having Hartenstein, need more help on the glass. And with iHeart out, they really need it. Chet has stepped up in that regard. And of course, then there's the three-point shot, which like I said before, tonight was not falling, but tonight, three of six, it's all the way back. He looked a lot more confident in it. He is a matchup nightmare for anybody in the NBA because you either put someone on him who's too small to contest his shots or you put one of those big burly guys on him. Someone that, oh, can back him down, can, you know, bully Chet Holmgren. I saw that in the playoffs with the Pelicans where they put Jonas Valanciunas out there and it's like, oh, Jonas is so big. How is Chet going to handle him? Well, Jonas is going to get a couple of buckets, but he doesn't have anywhere near the foot speed to keep up with Chet Holmgren. That's what happened to Nikola Jokic. Chet went out there and was cooking because Joker couldn't keep up with him. Vucevic couldn't keep up with him. Clint Capella, Yekka Kungwu, nobody can really keep up with Chet. He's so quick. He's very smooth with his handle as well and get into his spots. He's really smart and picks and chooses the right moments to shoot. He's not forcing a lot of things up. Chet is an absolute animal right now. If he continues to play like this, the only big men that I feel sure about being above him at the moment are Nicole Jokic, Joel Embiid, and Anthony Davis. That's it. I feel like Chet Holmgren at this current moment has a real argument for not just being a top five, but a top four big in the entire association. There are very few players ever that have had this combination of skill and size and have improved at such a rapid rate like it seems like Chet Holmgren does from game to game. I saw one comparison I like coming from, I believe it was Kendrick Perkins actually, who said that he gives him kind of Kevin Garnett vibes. I see that as this absolutely insane defender, somebody that can handle the ball a little bit like a guard that can shoot from the perimeter. I wish KG played in a more modern era because he definitely would have been shooting threes instead of those really, really long twos. But I definitely see it there. And I even saw someone tweet out the other day that Chet could be an MVP type player in his prime. And I don't think that's at all impossible when you talk about a big that is so offensively versatile, whose game is rapidly improving in only his second season and is already one of the best rim protectors, one of the best defensive players, period, in the entire NBA in his legitimate second season in the league. Again, just over a year removed from a season-ending foot injury, it's hard not to say that Chet could be an MVP type player someday. For sure, all NBA, I mean, right now, if he continues playing like this, which I think he will, even if the numbers come down a little bit, with the Thunder being as good as I believe they're going to be, Chet's going to be an all-star lock. Like, there won't be a conversation around it. There won't be like, oh, he's right there on the fringe. You know, maybe he gets snubbed. No, there will be a better discussion, a better argument for Chet starting in the all-star game than for Chet not being in the all-star game at all. I truly believe that with the impact that he brings to the table and he might be in serious all-NBA conversations if this keeps up. I really don't know how you stop the thunder with a Chet that is this aggressive, that is grabbing rebounds the way that he is, that is defending the way that he is, with Shea continuously playing at an MVP level on both sides of the ball, with Dub being really solid, and then all the defenders across the roster like Lou and Caruso and Kaysen Wallace, like I said, had Trey Young in absolute Alcatraz tonight, and this is all without Isaiah Hartenstein even playing. The Thunder have looked this dominant without iHeart playing it. iHeart is going to help out Chet a ton. He might take a little bit away from some of the stats, but just having another big body to play off of, someone that opposing bigs also have to worry about, the chemistry that the two showed in the preseason with the pick and rolls between the two, you know, dribble handoffs, passing to each other because they're both really solid passing bigs. It's only going to get easier for Chet. The only thing that might stop him from hoisting an MVP award someday is the fact that he plays with an MVP level guy right now in Shea Gilgis Alexander. I am having even a hard time picturing what he's going to look like at his peak if he's already this good in year two. Yeah, this team's scary. I told y'all, I told y'all the Thunder were going to be really, really good. Uh, you know, the Bulls and Hawks aren't like the craziest teams to beat to start off and the Nuggets don't look very good, but it's not like they're barely getting by. They're beating these teams absolutely convincingly without one of their most impactful players in Isaiah Hartenstein. So yeah, it's been an amazing beginning to the year. You knew I was going to make a Thunder video pretty quickly and I had to make a Chet one with the way that he's been playing so far. I'm so excited about this breakthrough. I'm also so happy that I was right about Chet Holmgren because even if the Thunder 
one who didn't get him. He was my favorite player in that draft class. I said he was going to be the best player. He was going to be highly impactful. And that people were way overthinking everything that we saw on the court just because he was kind of skinny. Clearly, that's not an issue for Chet. So yeah, shout out to him for playing as well that he is. Shout out to the Thunder for being 3-0 right now, playing the way that they have. They've been dominant. And Chet Holmgren is coming to an all-star game, maybe even an all-NBA team somewhere near you, coming up here soon. And there's a chance we may be talking MVP type player someday. Hey, we might even be talking defensive player of the year this year. I don't know if there's been anybody that's been more impactful defensively to start the season so far, maybe like Anthony Davis. But Chet's absolutely in that conversation right now. Moving on now to the rest of the games, uh, the Bucks faced off against the Nets in a game that felt like would kind of get them back on track, and instead they lost to the Cooper Flag hopeful Brooklyn Nets. Uh, a lot of that was because Cam Thomas had another masterclass, 32 points, 5 rebounds, 2 assists, 2 steals on 48% shooting, 29 from Dennis Schroeder, 13 from Cam Johnson, double-double from Nick Claxton, 13 from Noah Clowney. And the Nets led for the entire fourth quarter most of the night. They went up by as much as 22 points in the fourth. So credit to the Brooklyn Nets. I mean, this was a good win for them. The Bucks, on the other hand, kind of got fried and had absolutely nothing going offensively. And I'm getting concerned for them early. I know it's only three games into the year, but this is a game you really don't want to lose when last year in the Eastern Conference, everything was separated by like a game. Uh, Damon Giannis definitely have not developed the chemistry that people were hoping for. Still looks like a lot of my turn, your turn offense. We don't know how, how Chris is going to look when he comes back or even how long he'll be around with that injury. It feels like he's in and out of the lineup. They're old. They're slower than every team. Doc's not a very good coach. It's just kind of a mess right now with Milwaukee. I'm still hopeful they can put it together because they have talent but so far the defense looks bad the offense is not cohesive and the schedule they have coming up is tough the next few games they play the Celtics Grizzlies and Cavs twice over the next four and if they lost all four of those I wouldn't be that surprised and a one in six start would probably bring up some very serious conversations moving on now over to Clippers versus Warriors uh, the Clippers pick up another win they moved to two and one on the season with their one loss being a really close game against Phoenix it was another league game of Harden and Zubat's chemistry with some Norman Powell sprinkled in Harden finished with 23, 7, and 11. Zoo had 23, 18, and 6 on 53% shooting. And we're picking most improved players right now. It might be Zubots because I'm going to pull up his uh, full stats. I meant to pull those up before. He's currently averaging 22.7 and 14. Now, do I think those numbers hold? No, but it's been awesome to see him kind of evolve and really grow his game over the course of the season. They were just decimating the Warriors all night, him in particular. Uh, DJJ had 18 points on 7 of 10 shooting. A very productive game against a team that many people are projecting the Clippers to finish below in the standings. Specifically, they've been really pesky defensively. They forced 21 turnovers against the Warriors tonight. It's hard to win if you give up the ball that much. And for Golden State, they really came back down to earth in this one after annihilating the Blazers in the Jazz. It was a much worse game from some of the players that went crazy, like Buddy Heald, who was averaging 53 or so points per game per 36 coming into tonight. Shot 3 of 14. Uh, their lack of size got really exposed by the Clippers. They tried to run that 12-man rotation, and it really just didn't stand that much of a chance. Not to mention the bigger news, Steph Curry left the game with an ankle injury. It's not expected to be super severe, but he is supposed to probably miss at least a few games, and that's concerning because I don't see how this team survives at all if Steph Curry's not in the lineup. Like, they can maybe win a game here and there, but but if for some reason Steph has to miss more than like five to six games, it's going to get very bad for the Warriors very quick. But one thing that is a bright side in the midst of all of this is that Wiggins is seemingly back. He had 29 points, three rebounds in this one, 74% shooting, hit five threes, had a double-double, I believe, the game prior. Wiggins has looked great. This is looking a lot more like the Andrew Wiggins we saw in 2022 than the Wiggins we've seen the past couple of years. I know there's a lot of personal stuff going on for him in over that time, so hopefully he's in a better space right now. He's able to really just lock in. And I mean, so far, he's playing incredibly well, even if this game definitely Definitely tempered a lot of people's expectations with the Warriors after that very, very hot first two games. Over in Sixers versus Pacers, it was another game with no Joel Embiid or Paul George, but the Sixers get this one. They finally get a win in the season. The game went to overtime. It was a crazy ending where Tyrese Halliburton had a double clutch three to go ahead and send it to OT. And then in OT, the Sixers went up two and Caleb Martin intentionally fouled, thinking the Sixers were up three, but just sent Tyrese Halliburton, who's a great free throw shooter, to the line to go ahead and tie it up, but Halliburton misses a free throw. Uh, Philly holds on to win in the end. Weird, weird ending. Maxi's really been emptying the clip to start the season, and it's led to rough efficiency, but honestly, I'm okay with it. Like, you don't have your top two guys out there. Just put up your shots, man. And he ended up with 45 points, four rebounds, four assists on 44% shooting with five threes. A lot of four and fives in that stat line. Cale Martin, 17 and 12, double-double. Eric Gordon at 15, 14 from Kelly Oubre. I like the supporting cast. I think once the two stars come back, which they're both supposed to be back for their next game, against the Pistons. 
I think this team will be really, really good. Like Drummond had nine and 17 of like some of the minutes from Yabusele. Yeah, I think the Sixers are going to be good the first couple games. They should have won that one against the Raptors, but overall it's been fine. And the Pacers themselves fall to one and two with their one win coming against the Pistons. Not a very good start to the season. If Detroit held on just a little bit more, they would be 0-3 right now. And this game against the Sixers team is not one you want to give up. They got obliterated by the Knicks. The offense kind of just looks broken. Like Halliburton has been straight bad to start the season. He had no points against the Knicks for the third time in his career. Siakam only shot 11 times for some reason, despite being highly effective. It feels like they're almost afraid to step on each other's toes sometimes with this offense. Like they're like, okay, I can't take too many shots because people have to get involved. They need a hierarchy set up. They need Halliburton to be better. I feel like everything is going to eventually fall into place. But at the beginning here, it's not been super encouraging. And finally, we have Blazers versus Pelicans, which resulted in the Pelicans getting blown out. I didn't see it coming either. Another good game from Jeremy Grant, 28 points, eight and had a 17-12 double-double. Simon said 27. Don McClingan had nine and nine with two blocks in 13 minutes. I really need them to trade some of their older guys, like build up some value for Grant and Aiton and then send those guys off so I can get more like Donovan Klingon minutes and too many Kamaro is really good today. I just want to see the young guys play a little bit more. And for the Pelicans, the main takeaway is they desperately need size. They had no big bodies to throw at this Portland front court. And this front court like isn't even that good of one. I mean, it's talented with Aiton and Grant and Klingon and all those guys. But like imagine what happens when they go up against the Lakers with like LeBron and Anthony Davis or the Grizzlies with Jaron Jackson and Zach Eady and Jay Huff now who's a monster. They have to add a big at some point. I think everybody knows it, but maybe them, maybe David Griffin, their general manager is like the only one that hasn't figured it out yet. I don't think they're going to go too long before making a deal, especially with the fact that DeJounte Murray is going to be out for a little bit with a fractured hand. If they keep playing like this, they're going to have to make a move fast, and I do believe that they will. But yeah, with all that being said, those are my takeaways from these games. Let me know down below in the comments what your takeaways were, and what do you think about the Thunder so far? Specifically, Chet Holmgren, do you think he can make an All-NBA team this season? Do you think he could win Depoy? How do you feel about him, or my take on him, being that he's going to be an All-Star lock this season? And where do you think his ceiling goes? Could you see a day where Chet Holmgren is the MVP of the NBA, or am I going to look bit too far on that one let me know down below in the comments leave a like and subscribe hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos and yeah i'll see y'all later real one say it back